Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, things change quickly during a legislative session. This program was taped this past Tuesday. On Thursday evening, Senator Smith, chair of the Senate Finance Committee, revealed that the state's revenues had been revised dramatically downward by as much as 700 to $900 million, and that deeper cuts were needed to keep the state solvent. This information was not known at the time of this taping. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. I'm very excited to have two of the most, my most respected lawmakers. Today we have uh, Representative Larry Larinaga, Republican from District 27. Thank you for joining us. And Lucky Varela, uh, Representative, Democrat from District 48. Thank you for joining us. I have to tell people that for at least 10 years, we've been having the Lucky and Larry show, or the Larry and Lucky show, because you are my most respected financial wizards. And, and we've had such crushing news about the budget this year, and you ha all have managed to solve part of it. Let me just talk a little, well, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us, Laureen. And tell us a little about your background. Oh, my, my background, I'm a kid who grew up in New Mexico, in central New Mexico, in the Encino area. Uh, my, you know, my family's a large family, 13 brothers, sisters, uh, uh, we lived there. Uh, we, I went to school at the University of New Mexico, got a, a degree in engineering, went to graduate school at Northwestern University, studied there, came back and got a master's degree in engineering. I worked in state government at the highway department, the old highway. Cabinet for, secretary. Uh, cabinet secretary there, and I was deputy chief administrative officer for the city of Albuquerque after that. Then I went into private practice and did another 17 years of uh, working as, uh, in the consulting engineering business. But you have been a lawmaker since 1995, 21 years. 21 years this year, yes. Yes. Right. And Representative Varela, lucky. We are so lucky to have you. Tell me a little about your background. Okay, thank you. Uh, I uh, was born in the village of Pecos, 25 miles uh, east of uh, Santa Fe. And uh, when I was in high school, I had a teacher from uh, Chicago. And uh, when he asked me what my name was, I said, my name is Luciano. So he said, uh, Luciano, uh, there's a family back in Chicago by the name of Lucky Luciano. Uh, he said, so I'm going to give you the name Lucky. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll take it. So I did. So here I am. <laughs> well, lucky for us. Um, you have been a public servant for so many years, and now I have mixed feelings. You are retiring from after 29 years. Since 1987, you've been a lawmaker. Yes, but before that, you were with DFA, you were with the public schools, you had just years, I mean, how many years have you been in public service? I was uh, 25 in the executive branch and, of course, uh, going on 30 now in the legislature, so it's a little over 50 years, and uh, that's been pretty much my lifetime career, uh, and uh, so I've, uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Well, you know, we've, I just feel that we have been so blessed to have you both. Now, you, you share a certain amount of financial acumen that not many other people are ever, are ever given. So you have been a member, uh, the chair, actually, of the Interim Legislative Finance Committee. You've both always been on that. And then you uh, were co-chair of the House Appropriations Committee. You now chair the House Appropriations and Finance Committee. And what a job you have had to put together a budget. The purpose of the 60-day session is to create a budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Well, we had a bombshell. Which one of you would like to talk about what happened to us month by month <laughs> as we got closer to the session? I'll give uh, Lucky the opportunity to, to, to speak a little bit about that, and I'll fill in. Okay, Lucky. Okay, well, we started in July, and uh, very optimistic. You know, we said, well, we have 296 million new dollars that we can use uh, to build a budget between now and December uh, before we get into the legislative session. So we started uh, talking about uh, the revenue picture and uh, uh, recognizing that we had to track those dollars and make sure that the uh, circumstances didn't change. Uh, uh, 
and uh, and lo and behold, uh, in December, when uh, just before we started the session, uh, we had a, a report from the Legislative Finance Committee that the revenue uh, picture didn't look as well as it did in July, that we were down to 230 some million dollars, and uh, so we started building a budget with the chairman uh, uh, of the Appropriations Committee and myself and other members. And uh, then before we completed the budget, we decided to have our consensus of revenue estimators come in again and give us another uh, preview of the, the revenue picture. So they said, well, the picture has changed a little bit. Now we only have 30 million new dollars. So that uh, was a sort of a, uh, surprising and devastating to me to see that uh, from July to January, we had lost $200 million of the revenue estimate. Well, it was kind of a body blow to everyone involved in state government because we have some um, expenses we can't get around. When we did the Medicaid expansion, now we're having to pay. So there's $70 million there that we would have used all that nice new money for. And so uh, how did you receive this bombshell? Well, we, it made it challenging, but, uh, you know, we, we see the uh, uh, challenges we have in New Mexico because we have a very volatile uh, revenue when we depend on gas and oil. It's a very volatile industry, and so we see it go up, we see it come down. This year was uh, especially difficult and challenging because it came at, at a point when we were building the budget. We, we had built the budget at least what we thought were the revenues, as uh, Representative Varela said, and so we had to start readjusting those uh, numbers to make sure that we could have a, uh, a, a balanced budget. Uh, we didn't come close to uh, balancing it with the uh, uh, with the revenues that we had. So we looked for other areas where we we could use a, a, a little bit of revenue to be able to to get the budget all together and balance it out. So we uh, putting all that together, we provided a, a passed a budget out of the uh, House uh, uh, last Saturday and sent it over to the Senate, which we believe is uh, is is a pretty good ba pretty good budget it's balanced but obviously they're going to look at it and then uh, we'll uh, get our heads together and see if uh, if there's any adjustments or uh, or uh, changes that they'll look at uh, as a, as a review of the budget to get it back to us then we'll work it out so uh, I, maybe you could just clarify for our audience the the first budget the original the budget house bill 2 starts in the house and appropriations and finance you people have to you know, flesh it out, do the best you can. You did really an amazing job. Then it goes over to Senate, the Senate, and Senate Finance, and they tweak it. They add, subtract. Do you know what they're going to do? Well, there's always communication as to what how we develop the budget, which, as you say, it starts on the House side. Uh, then uh, you know, uh, we we do you know the 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 primary work on the on the budget. And we pass it out of the House and send it to the Senate. But uh, then they look and start uh, re looking at uh, at what adjustments or what changes they think are are necessary. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's all along we've had communications with the other side as to what we were doing, as it's happened in years past. You know, when uh, when. Uh, you know, when we were short of uh, of uh, revenues, we always have to be mindful of the fact that we have to coordinate with the uh, with the Senate side to, uh, to to let them know, you know, where we stand. And they they keep reviewing us, and we keep uh, you know in contact with them just to make sure that we are coordinating that the budget with them. Now, you had had an, an editorial that went out all around the state, pointing out that all the oil dependent states have had this problem of you know, really catastrophically crashing in revenues, and that there's two ways to handle it, increase taxes or cut, cut uh, you know, expenditures. So you managed to do an amazing job. I want you to tell me about it, but I want you to start, Lucky, with your quote, because <laughs> you had this wonderful, do you want to say it? <laughs> I'll, I'll let you say I'll it. I'll say it, okay, okay, you said, <clears throat> frankly, if you're going to keep milking the cow, you have to feed it at some point. <laughs> so if you're going to be distributing all this income, there has to be some money coming in. 
if I may, you know, it's much better as a folk saying. <laughs> so uh, how did you keep since, you know, the, this is nobody wants tax increases. How did you feed that cow? And talk to me about what sweeps are sweeping. Mm. Well, we started um, looking at um, what was causing uh, the declining revenues and uh, recognizing that uh, we could not consider raising taxes. Uh, we felt that perhaps uh, we had to find another way of uh, balancing that budget. And uh, in uh, looking at other uh, revenues that are already there, for the most part, we started uh, directing uh, the LFC and the executive to start looking for cash balances, to start filling the holes that uh, were there, you know, for the lack of uh, new dollars. So uh, the staff uh, put together a, uh, a bill that would transfer and uh, uh, fund balances that uh, uh, would assess uh, additional dollars, boards and commissions, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we did a sweep, as we called it, to try to balance that budget, and uh, we pretty much seem to have accomplished that. Is that House Bill 311? Yes. Yeah. I think Patty Lundstrom, Representative Lundstrom, called it the toughest bill in the session because a lot of those people you were sweeping their uh, accrued funds that weren't being used, they did not want to see them swept into the general fund. That's correct. But uh, when we looked at the total uh, needs for, for uh, building House Bill 2, we knew that we could only cut so much in certain areas, and we did. We cut some in higher ed, uh, had a little cut. Uh, a lot of agencies got a little cut. But then we were obligated to, uh, to uh, fund, uh, which is a, uh, an entitlement, uh, you know, Medicaid, uh, for example, as the expansion of the Medicaid that we have taken uh, that. And so we had to, we had to fund uh, Medicaid. We knew that... Uh, uh, schools uh, needed uh, enough money to open the doors and provide that meaningful education for our kids. We knew that we were going to have to look at uh, at adding some work for added workforce in in corrections and Department of Public Safety and Children, Youth, and Family, and probably provide a little compensation in that area. And in the courts and corrections judiciary part, we added a little money there as well, so that uh, you know we could take care of, uh, of uh, uh, the added cost or the new incurred costs that we're going to have in, in, in the area of the, the, the judiciary and the, and the district courts and district attorneys and the public defenders. So we were mindful of the fact that we have to uh, do that to uh, continue to, uh, to uh, you know, operate the, that side as well as, uh, as the agencies, you know, and, and with the schools as well. Well, you have been known for years as a champion of public safety, as you have also been a champion of state employees. And I, I know that you've had, a, you know, there's just not money to give raises, although I think you, you have a bill maybe that there'll be a small little raise. But I think everyone who's familiar with what's happening knows that there's just not a, any surplus. Um, some people complained about this sweeping away, I think, was it Representative Maestas who called this a doomsday budget? Because um, he said, what if we're worse off next year and we don't have, we can't, there's nothing left to sweep. But I think um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about is, do you see, you both have so much experience. You've seen the tide come in, the tide go out. You've seen years when, the, you know, we're just fat city with all the oil and gas money, and now we're, you know, skinny mini without it. So. Do you see any way to diversify our, our income stream as a state? What is your Talk to me about your philosophy mm -hmm. about this. There are ways that uh, we can address uh, revenue enhancement or broaden the, uh, the base, the tax base. And uh, sometimes, you know, when I look back at what we've done in, in not only uh, the current administration but in the, in the prior administration, we had an income tax cut that uh, was done uh, on personal income tax under Governor Richardson, mm -hmm. uh, very devastating to the personal income tax because income tax is supposed to be progressive, you know, the ability to pay. And uh, that uh, particular piece of legislation that uh, Governor Richardson uh, pushed and we passed and uh, uh, for uh, 
whatever reason, uh, the uh, the dollars that were supposed to come in as a result of the tax reduction never materialized. So we were able to uh, uh, then uh, try to balance a budget on a what I call more than just a uh, uh, flat budget or uh, uh, revenues that are somewhat regressive. And uh, so we need to take a good look at our tax base. You know, we have uh, credits and uh, and uh, other deductions that uh, approximate $900 million at this point in time. And perhaps some of those could be revisited. And uh, we've attempted to do this in the past, you know, s establishing a Blue Ribbon Task Force. Oh, it was the most brilliant minds. <coughs> that was a wonderful task force. And yet, and they worked so hard and came up with those re recommendations, and yet... Nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> well, that's the, the, the reason we need to... Uh, uh, what I would call bite the bullet. Uh, you know, uh, we have problems with our Department of Transportation also. Larry was a former uh, secretary of that department. And uh, now that uh, we need to broaden, uh, you know, the uh, revenues for the, for the road fund, we're trying to see how can we do that by uh, tightening our, uh, our uh, oversight, by collecting the taxes that are due and payable. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, New Mexico, uh, you know, I consider it to be a poor state. Uh, we have not progressed very well uh, in, the, in the last several years. I uh, you know we seem to be languishing last. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hate to be critical, but, you know, here we are. The policymakers that we are, we're supposed to find the best way to uh, improve our, our New Mexico economy, uh, uh, improve our education. Uh, grow our permanent funds, and uh, for some reason we were reluctant to do that. So it's bothersome to me. So I try to play the devil's advocate at some point in time. Well, we're speaking today with uh, Representative Lucky Luciano Varela, Democrat from Santa Fe, and Representative Larry Laranaga, a Republican from Bernalillo. Now, what are your thoughts on the long-term picture of the budget and state finances? Well, besides uh, looking at the tax structure that we have that uh, Representative Arela talked about, we also need to look at uh, diversifying our job creation. We know that at the federal level there's been a reduction uh, in, their, in their appropriations, in their budgets for uh, money that, uh, that it was coming to New Mexico, particularly to the labs and, uh, and Sandia Base and the, uh, and the military. And so uh, that the reduction of that means we have to diversify our, our job creation into the private sector. And we've done some things we, with that. You know, last year we, we put money in uh, Local Economic Development Act. Uh, yes. It's working at, to some degree. We, we continue to create uh, or put money in, uh, in the jobs training programs. Uh, and so we did that again this year to, to be able to, to uh, uh, Create the workforce that's needed to get us more to get us to a point where we're more competitive in getting the uh, uh, jobs that are from the private sector uh, there. So you know we have a, a two you know a, a, you know two two areas right there. One is the, is in the uh, is in the review of the uh, of the tax structure, creating jobs, and the other uh, the other side is looking at what we can do uh, in uh, in the. Uh, in the administration, in the executive, to look and uh, reprioritize some of the the the, the, uh, the uh, uh, you know the most uh, needed uh, uh, programs, but then review as we do through the Le uh, legislative finance committee. Review some of the programs who are maybe not as effective as the as they could be, and so we've got to look at all three sides of that to be able to make us you know at a point where we really can stay fairly stable and uh, and and uh, pro provide a, a good balanced budget for the people in New Mexico. Well, when Senator Keller was a senator, now he's our state auditor, he kept pushing a tax expenditure budget, an audit of all the exemptions that we have. It would be, and some of them are really practically buggy whips. I mean, they're really uh, archaic. They're no longer needed. But that would be a huge source of money if we could just look at what's really, you know, we keep doing a special exemption for airplane mechanics and for these other things. At the time, maybe they were necessary, but some of them are no longer important. If we could mm -hmm. 
you know, this is a major sweep to do, is to close some of those things. But I think it would take a tremendous will on the part of the legislature or the executive to absolutely say, well, let's take a cold, hard look at this. And at some time, we're going to have to start looking at. There's no doubt about that, you know. We, uh, we're, uh, you know, at a point where we're just saying uh, everything should be on the table to review uh, it so that we look at having a, a more uh, broader uh, tax uh, base there so that we, we're not uh, dependent, uh, just dependent uh, on gas and oil and uh, and. Uh, and the uh, small little businesses, we've got to broaden that. We've got to look at what those exemptions, whether they're good or bad. Yes. Are you, can, is there anything we can be optimistic about? First of all, <laughs> you, you did a Herculean task to to put together this budget with, given the hand that you were dealt, it was really a tough one. And even I understand that even the first week that you were working on it, it was revised <laughs> downward again. You just think, no more news, no more mm. news. And I just heard one of the senators on the floor today said oil was $27 a barrel. We just can't take any more news. But is there, are there things for us to be optimistic about besides the, the, the resiliency of New Mexico and the New Mexico citizen and the New Mexico economy? Well, there's always um, room for improvement. Uh, you know, when I look at uh, our job creation, um, uh, system in New Mexico, uh, we seem to lag the rest of the country when it comes to the recovery of the economy. The and worst in unemployment, the worst in, oh, it's so horrible. It's uh, disheartening to, to uh, see those statistics. And uh, then, of course, uh, we uh, emphasize public safety, and uh, mm -hmm. you get reports that uh, the worst place to raise a kid is New Mexico because of the, uh, you know, not being a safe uh, place for or children to grow up. Uh, these are very uh, disappointing uh, uh, statistics. Uh, yet, you know, you try to be the eternal optimist. Uh, you know, when I look at uh, plugging the holes, as we called it now, with our with our uh, uh, swaps that uh, that we mentioned, I always look at the, our uh, revenue estimators and say, put your collective heads together. Let's look at the out ears. What's going to happen two years from now? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we expect? To give us your best estimate on that, because we need to be prepared for that. And that's uh, that's one of the things that I always advocate for is uh, let's look at the out years, two or three years uh, of the out years, and hopefully we'll see a, uh, a little bit of sunlight at the at the end of the tunnel. Well, actually, it may be sunlight. <laughs> we may have to use solar and renewable energy. <laughs> but please, please, Larry, what sure, do you think? There's also mm -hmm. the, the fact that New Mexico is still a, an attractive place for tourism. People come here, you know, for... You know, for many reasons, one of those is arts, you know, some of those is, uh, is museums, some of that is skiing, some of that is a, a just flat good weather that we have in New Mexico. So that continues to grow. That grows our gross receipts tax. That's the kind of a, the, the, you know, kind of a bright side of that. We'll always uh, have to b recognize that that's one of the areas that we uh, can work with. Uh, you know, as a as a means of uh, uh, growing our state in in that area, and so that's an area. The other area is is that we know that eventually uh, this economy is going to turn around. It's not going to you know uh, stay this way forever, and we hope that we uh, begin to lead into those areas where. Uh, uh, where the job markets are, and we can be competitive to get uh, more jobs here in the state of New Mexico. So both of you have been around long enough to see the highs and the lows and the mm -hmm. highs and the lows. Is this the lowest of the lows for a while that you've seen? <laughs> uh, almost as low as when Tony and I came in as governor. Uh, I remember that the, the roof caved in at the time also. But uh, we were able to, uh, to address the issue both with expenditure cuts, but also we raised some, uh, some additional revenue. And so we were able to balance the budget without too much pain. Uh, so it's uh, a little bit different from uh, what happened then. Uh, and uh, I was uh, hopeful that uh, this year we p could perhaps um, find a way to uh, enhance the dollars. But, uh, you know, it's a difficult process. People want more, but they don't want to pay less. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a two-edged sword. Yeah. yeah. And, and when, uh, you know, in the 83, 84 time period, the, the, the revenues dropped by 20%. 
you know, this year when we saw the, the, the revenues drop, the, the percentage, we were in the 3% mm -hmm. range and that sort of thing. So, you know, there's a, there's a, it's not as drastic as we've seen before. But we've seen this uh, up and downs, and uh, we can't get too high when, it, when, the, when the economy is that, uh, that great. And we can't get too low when it's just down uh, at, 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 a, at a low point like we are right now. But it's, we've seen it lower and we've seen it higher. Yes. Now, our reserves, are our reserves in good enough state to kind of be a little bit of buffer, depending on which way things go in the immediate future? Yes. They're, they're uh, a little over 6% at this point in time. But I remember that um, at once upon a time we said, well, we can bring them down as far down as 5%. Uh, and I don't know whether we may have to do that. You know, we provided some contingencies in the budget uh, with language to move dollars in, into the uh, into the uh, operating reserves, so that uh, in the event that uh, we need to uh, uh, cut more more dollars out of the programs, you know, we'll have the ability to do that. But uh, uh, you know, this is uh, we're trying to estimate almost a year in advance, six months at yeah. least. It's very difficult with the volatility that we have in the markets, not only in the country, but also around the world. Yeah. So it's very difficult to estimate what's going to happen in six months, much less uh, a year from now. And your final words on the subject? We always, we always survive in New Mexico. You know, New Mexico is known as a, a poor state in, 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 in uh, salaries and, and things like this. But New Mexico, when the, the, the fallacy in part of this is they compare us to, uh, uh, you know, states like uh, uh, M Massachusetts or something like that, you know. We don't have that tax base. We don't have that high income, you know, that you see someplace else. But we make it up by, you know, the... Uh, quality of life that we have in, in the state of New Mexico. And we can get by with a, a little less, you know, than some of the other states can. So, you know, we've been used to that. We're not, uh, we've never been a, a very wealthy state, but you know, it's, uh, that's New Mexico. We, you know, we live very well within the, the uh, salaries that we have. In the, and I'm optimistic that we will, you know, uh, turn this around and uh, there'll be better days ahead. Let's leave it on that optimistic note. Um, I'm very privileged today that we got to discuss state finances with two of the leaders, really, whose who's hand on the helm of the state budget and finances. I've trusted you both for so long. I really want to thank you. Our guests have been Representative Larry Laranaga. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining Bye. us, and thank you for all of your work. And it's the last time for the Larry and Lucky show because <laughs> uh, Representative Lucky Luciano Varela, Democrat from Santa Fe, you are going to be stepping down after 29 years yes. in um, the legislature. Thank you so much. Both of you, 50 thanks. years of public service in the legislature. Yep. Thank you Enjoyed so much. Enjoyed every minute of it. Well, it's been a great trip and it's been great working with a, a guy like Lucky Varela. Absolutely, absolutely. All the best to you. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, things change quickly during a legislative session. This program was taped this past Tuesday. On Thursday evening, Senator Smith, chair of the Senate Finance Committee, revealed that the state's revenues had been revised dramatically downward by as much as 700 to 900 million dollars, and that deeper cuts were needed to keep the state solvent. This information was not known at the time of this taping. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.